Welcome to GEMA Live and to our third lesson in our webinar series, which is on Flux Healed Ruby. I'm Julia Griffith. I'll be your presenter. I'm from juryadvisor.com. Let's just launch straight into the webinar, shall we? So let's find out what we're going to learn today. So we're gonna focus completely on a treatment known as flux healing, which mainly occurs in rubies. It can be performed on sapphires, but otherwise uh, not on any other gem. So we're going to look into what this treatment is and a bit about the history of this treatment, so how it came about. We're then going to talk about how this stone is, um, is affected by this treatment and also uh, how it's viewed within the trade and how it's graded. And then lastly, of course, we're going to find out how we can identify this treatment. And like with many other treated stones, the only way for identification or the best way for identification is often with observation. So we're going to have lots of lovely pictures at the end for us to all learn what to look for. So to start off, I think the first thing we really should talk about is what is flux? in this flux healing treatment. So generally speaking, a flux is actually a solvent. So it is uh, something that originally starts as a solid, and then as we heat it up, it turns molten, and then it has the ability to dissolve other materials. Now, what is a flux to one thing might not necessarily be a flux to another. So what can damage one material isn't necessarily the same for another. But for ruby, what, uh, the flux that damages our rubies is actually a type of borax, which you may have heard before because we can coat diamonds in borax to actually protect them from heat and diamonds are fine with borax. But for rubies, actually, this acts as a solvent and will actually dissolve the surfaces of the rubies. If we have a look at the pictures that I've got here for you, which are from Henry Hanny from SSEF, you can see that actually these surfaces of all four of these rubies are um, uneven and mottled. Uh, the reason for that is because they have been in contact with a flux. This has dissolved away some of the surfaces and then upon cooling actually may have redeposited some of the corundum back on the surface as well. So you end up with this very uneven surface. So that's what flux will do to ruby. Now, the particular type of flux that we use, so it's borax, which is a borate. This is actually uh, typically a sodium borate, which is a bit of sodium and then boron with oxygen. And also they're gonna have silica. So this is uh, generally known as a borosilica. This is our type of flux. And for all of you that love chemistry, which I'm sure you all do, uh, here's the chemical composition. So we're dealing with um, Silica, so uh, silicon and oxygen, then boron, then our oxygen as well, so that's our borate. And inside the borax, um, we also have some extra aluminium in this case. So we've got silica, boron, oxygen, and aluminium. The reason that aluminium is there is a very interesting one for this treatment and key, in fact. So aluminium plus the oxygen that we have from the borate is actually going to create aluminium oxide. And for all of our chemi chemists that are watching or for any of our gemologists, we know that aluminium oxide, uh, once it crystallizes, is actually our corundum. So that chemical composition and what borax is will become very key when we talk about the method of this treatment. Okay, but then just to let you know, when borax does cool and after it's crystallized out anything that is to be crystallized, we're actually left with a glassy sub, uh, substance because that's the borosilicate hardened. So silica is just a glassy substance that's left after it's cooled down. So let's talk about flux healed rubies. So flux healed rubies, this was a brand new treatment that emerged on the market in waves. Like it was a surge of all these treatments, um, a brand new product. And basically uh, what all of these stones had had done to them is they had actually been heated in a flux and the flux had actually gone in to any of the fractures within the rough material and had healed them shut. So this was something brand new, brand new on the market. Um, and yes, it absolutely dominated the market for that time. So key points at this stage, uh, it absolutely took over the market, actually about 99% of all rubies traded in Thailand around the time of 1992 to so early 1990s were these flux healed rubies that all hailed from Mong Su. Now, uh, key points again, this treatment is performed on rough material 
because I'll show you the rough material in a second. You'll see that actually it's not gem quality in its rough state. And the key thing about this is that it's permanently healing for fractures. This is something that isn't done by any other treatment. So if we think about our glass filling treatments, whether we're talking about surface repair, glass filling, or our lead glass filling, which if you were with me a couple of weeks ago, we talked about at length, these are treatments that fill the fractures to make them less noticeable. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is that the flux is healing, permanently healing those fractures and turning them into feathers. So um, they're not completely invisible, they turn them into these partially healed fractures, so they're feathers. And that just changes everything. So let's have a look. Um, oh, before I move on, actually, so the result of this was actually we had a lot more ruby on the market, particularly those of small sizes. So the majority of rubies from Mongsu are normally less than 50 points, so not so half a carat. Um, but we also get an awful lot in good sizes from one carat to one and a half carats. And there are three to five carat stones on the market that have been flux sealed as well. So really opened up um, all of these Ruby products are suddenly available. Now let's have a look at what that rough material looks like from Mong Su. So uh, Mong Su, when this deposit was discovered, it was a very large deposit, so lots of ruby inside. However, this is your typical rough material. Uh, there's a few things about it which make it non-gem quality. Uh, one of the things you're probably noticing is that we've got these really dark central cores in the crystal. So they're actually dark blue, uh, almost black in some instances. Uh, so that straight away is not really desirable in our rubies. So really they've got sapphire cores. Also, their transparency isn't the best because a lot of the rough material had very dense silk clouds within them. So they were heavily included with rutile needles, which caused their transparency to not be as clear. They look cloudy. And very importantly, which is really what the flux healing is all about, this rough material was heavily fractured. So riddled with fractures, so to speak. And because of these fractures, in this state, this material is not gem quality because you can't facet it. If you did manage to get some that maybe had less fractures in, okay, you'd be able to get maybe a small stone out of it. But generally speaking, most of the Mongsu is just... Um, unmarketable at this um, state, so we have to treat it. But luckily, flux healing actually solves all of these issues. So let's talk about what our flux healing method actually involves. So first of all, we actually tackle those dark blue or black centers. So we do this via a relatively low temperature heat treatment. So 900 degrees Celsius, we heat up the rough material and this effectively removes the blue coloration, uh, making it a lovely consistent bright red color. Then we will coat it in our borax powders. So uh, basically we um, cover this in that borosilicate uh, with aluminium, subject it to very high heat treatments. So we're talking 1500 degrees to 1800 degrees Celsius. And at these levels, uh, the flux will melt and it will enter into every single open fracture that's available. And the viscosity is really low of this melted flux. And actually it will fit into every nook and cranny. We're talking down to five microns in um, width. So that's 0.005 millimeters. So really getting in everywhere. And then what happens at this stage due to its solvent nature so uh, it can actually dissolve all of those inner walls of the cracks and upon cooling what will happen is all of that material within the flux that is aluminium oxide will crystallize out and heal the fracture from the inside out permanently mending the fracture let's look at that with a diagram here we go so just going to talk through it stage by stage very first picture, uh, this is an open fracture. So uh, you've got access from the outside in and what they do is they will fill this with this flux material. So the flux seeps in when it's molten and fills in every nook and cranny that it can. This is the very important stage because what happens is the hotter our uh, flux gets, it actually is able 
to uh, dissolve more and more of this aluminium oxide material. So it's getting more and more saturated the hotter that it gets. And then when we cool the flux down, this is when the flux becomes super saturated with this aluminium oxide material. And what will happen is the aluminium oxide will crystallize out of this fluxy material, redepositing on all of those inner fracture walls, slowly but surely sealing them shut. What happens then is it will some look a bit like this. Uh, obviously, this is um, just a diagram, but what we're looking at here is this orange area here. This is actually our newly grown ruby. It's in orange here, uh, just to show where it is in real life the new ruby that's been deposited and the original natural ruby will be you know, absolutely consistent in appearance. There'll be no distinction uh, of color or anything. So you end up with these sealed areas, which arguably now is synthetic ruby because it has been created with an artificial process. So you have this healing shot of the synthetic ruby, and then you end up with all of these areas here where flux gets trapped. Uh, this is just what happens, it's completely unavoidable. Uh, but basically in these trapped areas, flux will basically get sealed off as the ruby is growing in the fractures. And then in these sections, you've got this fluxy mix, which may, may still crystallize out and you know close that gap slightly, but you're always gonna end up with just that borosilica at the very end. So it can't crystallize into ruby, it's kind of just stuck there. So then you end up with this borosilica stuck in these areas, and technically that's a glass. So you end up with these trapped glassy residues inside the fractures. So then really it's a partially healed feather. You can also see these tiny gas bubbles. So two phase inclusions trapped within these feathers are really common. Uh, the reason for that is that the flux continues to contract as it cools, causing these contraction bubbles. So here is now our healed fracture. It's now a feather which is def a definition of a feather is a partially healed fracture. So you're always gonna get these trapped areas of material that can't crystallize out. And at the very top here, you can actually see nearer the surface where the crack was wider, uh, it wasn't able to heal completely shut. So then this is just filled with a glassy residue. Over here, so picture number D, you can actually see that something else is starting to happen to the glass at the surface. This blue area here is actually uh, signifying a crystallization of this glass right near the surface. This is something that can happen when glass slows, uh, beg your pardon, when glass cools down really slowly, what happens is uh, it starts to crystallize. It's, it's a process known as devitrification means it starts to act unglass like and actually starts to crystallize. So that's a potential feature that you see at the surface of this otherwise little glass filled cavity here at the top. Now, uh, there is a bit of confusion in uh, flux healed treatments because where we are using a glassy flux, we're not uh, filling the material with flux. You know, that's not the point of this treatment. If anything, this flux glass that's been trapped here is a bit of a nuisance. I'm sure the treaters would much rather it not be there. But where we do have, as particularly this glass right here at the top, it is arguable in the trade that this could be classed as a glass filling right here at the top even though the flux healing you know, is in a way much more dramatic and that's all going on down here, at the very surface that could be argued, it's a glass filling. So therefore, uh, there's two things that can happen. Either it will get left there, but then it will get classed as not only flux healed, but it will also get classed as glass infilled. So it's got two treatment classifications if they do this, as well as heat treatment, three. Uh, or they could actually remove that glassy area. And that's normally the preference uh, for treaters and also well, anyone that owns one, they will want to remove that very top layer of glass so that it's classed as flux healed only and heat treated. Okay, so often they will use just hydrofluoric acid, uh, which is actually very dangerous. I've made it sound far too casual there. Uh, hydrofluoric acid just to get rid of that silica area at the top. And that's our flux healed process. So let's just pull back a sec and actually talk about how this treatment does improve the stone. Because actually there's a whole host, there's a big list of what we've done to this stone. So firstly, we have affected its color. That was from the heat treatment. We've made it redder and removed all of those blue tones. Uh, also, we've improved the clarity. 
from the really high heat treatment that we used, which was 1500 degrees plus, uh, 1500 degrees and above is what can dissolve rutile needles. So we've actually dissolved those inclusions into the surrounding ruby, making the stone more transparent. And then we've also affected the clarity due to this fracture healing process. So we've uh, healed the fractures permanently, leaving feathers. So uh, feathers, basically, it's a scar of where a fracture once was that's now been healed. And uh, arguably, feathers are less noticeable. They're less offensive to the eye in a way than an open fracture, because fractures can really reflect and scatter the light. So clarity is also improved from that point of view. We've also increased the stability of the stone. So an open fracture is very uh, easily knocked and can split the stone completely in half. So therefore a sealed fracture, actually the durability and stability of the stone really goes up, you know, so, um, and even to the point where this can be, you know, cleaned in an ultrasonic steam cleaner, it's absolutely fine because those fractures are closed, they're sealed. So stability is massively increased. And very importantly, we've also increased potential yield from the rough material, because arguably uh, the rough material is so fractured that it could not facet a lot of the sizable stones that we get out of it. For example, if we have a look at this picture here, this is a flux healed ruby. This isn't particularly large, but it is around five by seven millimeters, if my memory serves me correctly. And even with this flux field ruby, uh, you'll notice, first of all, the multiple feathers within it, but also notice where the feathers are. They're extending from edge to edge of the stone. That's really typical for flux healed stones because the rough was completely fractured. So even just looking at this little stone, we can see that this stone actually wouldn't exist in this size um, if it hadn't have been flux healed because look we can see a huge fracture running there so straight away we would have got one you know two-thirds of the size let alone all the other fractures that are in there so let's talk about um, how this is termed in the trade and uh, mainly in laboratories as well so what you can expect to see on reports so um, typically they will say heat treated with the assistant <clears throat> Ooh, I'll try that again. Heat treated with the assistance of flux. So they will acknowledge that it has been heat treated and that there's flux there as well. And here's another one, indications of heating and flux healing of feather. So that's another typical one as well. And then also you might see something like this, flux healing and surface repair or glass infilling. So what we have here is the top two uh, phrases that you see that you might find on certification. That is when uh, the flux healing and all of those glassy residues remain inside the stone. Nothing is on the surface. And then this last one here, this is if they didn't give it an acid bath afterwards. So if the glass, you know, still reaches the surface in some areas, even in the smallest cavity, it can get classed as this latter uh, phrase, which then suggests that it's two types of treatments, not only flux healed, but also surface repaired or glass infilled. So uh, just to let you know, between these two treatments, and we'll talk about it more in a bit, but the top two, these are actually classed as general treatments. So um, they are to be disclosed at point of sale, but otherwise it's kind of uh, approached with the same attitude as heat treatment. Whereas the last one here, that is actually uh, classed as a very um, specific treatment that must be very clearly disclosed at the point of sale due to the fact that it's glass infilled. I'm gonna give you some history on glass infilling. Uh, because I think that's important to really understand, uh, you know, what's going on here, because there is a bit of um, sensitivity, if you like, around glass infilling. Uh, I would like to very clearly state at this point that we are not talking about lead glass filling at all. We're not talking about that. That is a different treatment done on different rough with very different effects and different visual observations. But glass infilled ruby, just to give you a bit of a history. So this is actually a treatment in its own right that came about in 1984. This is when it was first seen on the market and it was performed on nice large faceted pieces of ruby. Um, so, you know, not in the rough, uh, but basically these nice large pieces um, of ruby often may have had some cavities or some naturals from the rough crystal on the back of the stone. And what they did is they used a silica, just a normal silica, um, just to 
put and fill those fractures in so that the ruby looked like one complete ruby and improved the overall appearance of the stone somewhat. Uh, so this would increase the appearance and also clarity and the weight of the stone, which people didn't like because, you know, if you're paying $3,000 a carat, you don't want any of it to be glass. Um, but basically, this was quickly rejected from the trade. The consumers didn't want it, then the traders didn't want it, and it very much disappeared from the trade, really. And this product with these glass areas at the back uh, just wasn't accepted. And these were phrased as surface repair or glass infilled rubies or also glass filling. Where now we have quite a few different things that involve glass, I try and not say glass filling because I feel like it sounds a bit too vague. So I'm going to keep to just saying glass infilled when it's just this normal silica glass in the stone. OK, uh, but so since then and since this particular treatment occurred, uh, now there is this sensitivity where if there is any glass on the surface, which has this lower luster, as you can see here, they class that as glass in filling. So uh, a very, very specific treatment. So that's why uh, really, even though when you're flux healing, you get this tiny glass deposit at the top. They don't want that. They want to get rid of it so that it doesn't get classed in this category also. So let's talk about glass healed versus, I uh, beg your pardon, oh, that didn't make sense. Let's talk about flux healed versus glass infilled because we can get the two treatments in one ruby. So how do we define these two treatments in the trade? And you know, where does flux healing end and glass infilling begin? Uh, the answer is, is that it's all defined by visual features. So laboratories will, go by what they can see. If they can only see features from flux healing, so therefore no residues of glass on the surface, but okay, maybe glass residues just trapped in the fractures, then it will get classed as heat treatment and flux healed. And this is classed as a general treatment, meaning it just needs general information at point of sale. However, if there is any evidence of glass reaching the surface, then it will also be classed as glass infilled. And this is a specific treatment that requires very clear disclosure upon advertisement and point of sale. So treated, glass infilled, and flux healed, and heated. Okay, so uh, that's really where the distinction lies, is uh, whether the glass reaches the surface or not. That's how the trade separates them out. So just to show you some disclosure, I know this is a lot of writing, I apologize. Uh, so this is actually uh, some snippets from Sibjo. So just showing you how the trade views this treatment. So flux healing and glass infilling in the trade. So uh, the first one basically is heat treatment and flux healing. So gemstones permanently altered by heating. I'll read this out to you. A gemstone may still be classified in this category when residues from the heating process are present within healed fissures. So that's referring to the flux trapped within the stone, so flux healing. However, when healed fissures are polished flush with the surface of the stone, the residues should not be visible by having a different polished luster, which is a feature of glass, to the host material. So as long as it, you know, is as described here, then it's classed as just flux healed and heated only, and just requires the same level, really, of um, information as is given to a heated ruby. Then uh, you have your glass infilled ruby, so gemstones altered by the filling of open fractures or cavities, even though this is uh, just what happens in flux healed stones sometimes, if you haven't cleaned it out at the end, and when your filled fractures and cavities are polished flush with the surface and have a different polished luster, they will then have to be very clearly disclosed as glass infilled, so treated or glass filled, it suggests here, so glass infilled, okay? So let's have a look at this uh, terminology as well in a laboratory. So basically, um, how else you can tell, you know, what's happened to this stone. So typically, uh, laboratories will actually do a grading system. This is just one example of a grading system that's used by a laboratory, which indicates the degree of flux healing that's taken place. Although arguably it's very hard to tell the exact degree of how much healing's taken place unless you see the before and after rough, but it gives an indication of how heavily they've been treated. So at the very top, if it is heat only, uh, it would just have an H. 
there is another more popular system actually that has um, TE for thermal enhancement. Okay, but it will, if it's heat only, no flux, you will actually have this. And this is a much more rarer stones. Uh, and yes, so that would be heat only, no flux involved. Then you have this grading of the flux. So HA, so that's insignificant flux residues, HB, minor flux residues, HC for a transitional grade. So I guess significant flux and then HD if there's major flux residues and also within fissures and cavities that touch the surface. So this is how it's graded. Uh, there is a more popular grading uh, one which is TE, so TE stands for thermal enhancement and also they then grade the level of flux from T1 to T5, so that's one that's used by GIA and SSCF and things. Um, but let's just have a look at one of these flux sealed rubies and then we'll go on to identification in a second too. I've got so many pictures for you. But flux sealed rubies, here's one. This is three carats, believe it or not. It's quite a deep stone actually. So it doesn't look particularly large. Uh, but this one I saw, this was in 2017, I saw this and it was actually being traded, I think it was around $14,000 to $15,000 um, net. So for the whole thing and that was trade price. Now, this one was actually graded HA, so insignificant flux residues. But if we have a look on the inside, it's um, showing me all of the, or showing us all of the really typical features that you see in flux healed stones. So, namely, this multiple surface reaching feathers um, that are really extending from end to end of the stone. That's really, really typical for all stones that are flux healed, even though those really that are classed as insignificant. Although some can be better, of course, but mostly I see them riddled with these fractures. And just to talk about um, the view really on flux healing and heat treatment. So there is actually a bit of um, a divide within the trade slightly. And this has been going on really ever since uh, this treatment first came onto the market, really. And uh, basically, it's a conversation of whether um, this flux healing is just a part of the heat treatment process or whether it is very much a treatment in its own right and should be classified as so and treated very, very differently. So it seems to be uh, two different main opinions. So one is that this treatment is unintentional. It's just one of those things that has to happen um, during heat treatment. You know, it will fill into the fractures and it's just one of those things that just happens. Uh, however, there is then the other side of the trade who very much think it's an intentional treatment because if, you know, a heat treatment can be done without flux, it's been done since the 70s in these very, very high temperatures. Um, and really, um, you know, there is this conversation where they believe that, you know, they are doing it purposely for those healing uh, of the fractures. So, yeah, if uh, you were to look at it objectively, so taking out whether it's intentional or not, um, you, you know, from looking at the effects of the treatments, just heat treatment alone versus flux healing, they are very different treatments. They do do very different things. One is affecting the color. One is permanently healing fractures. So it is very different. And uh, it does actually affect really the amount of material on the market. Because if we were to imagine that flux healing wasn't possible, if this was something that we couldn't do, then actually we would have a lot less gem quality ruby on the market. So um, considering that at times it's provided 80, 90 percent of rubies being traded um, minus lead glass filling. But so apart from that, 80 to 90 percent of rubies have this treatment. You know, really, uh, rubies would be much rarer if this treatment didn't exist because we are creating uh, rough material that can facet larger gems that otherwise wouldn't exist. So let's just have a look um, and do a bit of a summary break before we move on to identification features. So this is a treatment It came about in 1992 and it's treating heavily fractured rough material from Mong Su. However, there have been deposits since then that also have this treatment, but Mong Su was just the first one and was a very significant source. Uh, also, um, there is a, another very major deposit, which I'll talk about a bit later from Monte Puez in Mozambique, which also a lot of this material now comes from. But arguably anything fractured could be flux healed. So this is a treatment that permanently heals the fractures. That's kind of the main thing about flux healing. Okay, uh, and it is classed as a general treatment currently. 
So let's talk about identification. So we've got lots of observational things that we can look for. So the first thing is multiple surface reaching feathers. This, uh, I've seen hundreds of these stones and in every single one, these large fractures or feathers going from end to end really are my first clue that this could be flux healed. Uh, then if you have a really close up look at those feathers, uh, you'll notice that they're not feathers that you see, they're not the same as feathers you see in natural um, ruby, they are actually flux feathers. So inside the unhealed areas, you have that flux residue, and this takes on typically a granular or whitish translucent appearance. And that is key to knowing that these are contain flux and not just normal uh, natural liquids that you'd find in non-flux heat treated ruby feathers. Uh, but just to let you know, because you know gemology doesn't like to be too easy, these feathers can also be transparent and smooth, but typically you get a mixture, but we're going to try and focus on these granular whitish ones. Other features are pits on the surface directly above a feather. Uh, this is indicative and not diagnostic, however, um, due to the fact that the fractures feathers extend from end to end, those feathers have been cut through, you end up seeing all of these teeny tiny pits over the surface. So that is very indicative. And then we can also test them in a lab. I'm not going to focus on this too much, uh, so I'll just get it out there now. So uh, generally speaking, the main piece of equipment that you can use for advanced lab testing will be your FTIR, so that's your Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrometer. Uh, this is something that measures stones in the infrared and for Mongsu flux sealed ruby you get a real key absorption line at 3309 centimeters to the minus one that tells you that it's from Mongsu and that it's been flux healed. Apart from that really um, with the FTIR and also the Raman as well these machines can identify localities for rubies if you've got a very good database, uh, but otherwise nothing else that I've read at least, let me know if I'm wrong, uh, but that I've read actually lets you know that it's definitely flux healed. It comes from observation. Okay, so let's look at some pictures. Okay, uh, surface reaching feathers to start off with. So here we've got a few of our flux healed rubies. Notice that the feathers are multiple. They extend from edge to edge and the stones are riddled with these things. So this is really typical for all of these flux healed rubies. That's your first clue are these very extensive uh, feather networks. If we were to zoom in and look closer at these flux healed feathers, uh, we'll actually notice, first of all, they have a real globby or drippy appearance to them. So um, often your natural ones are more complex. These ones a bit more simplified, but these uh, real drippy globby inclusions. And if we looked really closely at the insides of them, we are hoping to actually spot those flux areas. So here, if we have a look at just this area here, can you see that inside this area here, this is your trapped flux. All of this would have originally been a fracture, but most of this is permanently healed, so it looks wonderful. But in these areas here, that's your trapped flux. And where it's whitish, and here you can actually see it's got a texture, like a granular texture, that is your trapped flux. You may also see some gas bubble areas in there as well. And even down here, we've got some transparent uh, flux areas here. You can still see just about the granular structure. Now, this was really zoomed in on a microscope here, so I apologize it's not the clearest, but it's quite hard to photograph. And here is another flux feather. So you can notice this whitish appearance, completely different from what you get in natural. So all of the white areas, that is your trapped flux. Okay, just for comparison basis, here is a natural feather. So uh, typically these are more complex. Often they surround a crystal and also uh, they may be fully encapsulated in the stone because where they haven't been healed artificially, you know, that must reach the surface, but these can get fully encapsulated in the stone. So these are all clues that it is natural. Uh, also, you'll notice that the whole feather, if you really focus in on the unhealed areas, which are these tube-like structures you can see, uh, they're transparent, they're not whitish or translucent. And that's th true for the whole thing, okay? So that's how you can tell them apart. But it does require some study and some practice experience comparing these feathers. But once you've seen a few flux-healed feathers, you know, you'll spot them every time. 
here are the pits on the surface. So uh, due to the fact that the feathers do extend throughout the stone and, you know, and beyond, if the rough material is still there, they've been polished through. So here, what you're actually looking at is we're looking at our table of our gemstone and we can see that you've got a bit of reflected light on there. So it is giving us a bit of reflection. And then here, disturbing that reflection, you've got a line of these pink dots. And what these are, these are areas that aren't reflecting back at you, and that's because they are pits within the surface of the stone. And you can notice that they're sitting directly above this feather below them. So here is your healed feather that's um, been created with this flux healed process. The stone has then been polished, and we've literally cut through the feather. So it leaves these areas that would have originally contained flux residues, but we've then since clean them out with acid so they are just these little pits on the surface. These can be seen sometimes in natural rubies that if their feather has been polished through you may get these pits on the surface as well but they will not be as numerous as they are on a flux healed ruby because remember every single feather you've got here or most of them will extend to those edges you'll see them if you focus in really carefully with a microscope you'll see them you know, everywhere at those edges of those feathers. Here they are again. So we're just looking at that reflected facet here and all of this disturbance on the surface, each one of these is a little pit, you know, where it was that unhealed part of the feather. To talk about flux healed and glass infilled, so those flux healed rubies that are also classed as having that glass infilling right at the surface, these have some additional features, which I've kept just a little bit separate so that we're not to confuse them. Uh, so we also get, as well as all of those flux healed features I just showed you, we're also going to get some additional features from the glass infilling that's right at the surface. And this includes uh, the luster difference from the glass area to the ruby area, because the glass lower hardness, lower RI, so therefore has this lower luster. And also we're gonna see those devitrification features. So uh, that was the areas of crystallization right near the surface that I showed you before in the diagram. But we're gonna look a bit closer at those. So these features are typically seen in any, they could be seen in any flux sealed material, but if that glass isn't acid washed out, at the very end. Now this is very typical for a material from a newer locality. So this is from uh, Monte Poet in Mo Mozambique. So uh, in 2009, a really large deposit was found here. Um, and these materials, um, they were quite dark purple in color, uh, but key thing is that they were again riddled with these fractures, quite large fractures. So what they decided to do with this rough material and it worked, they flux healed uh, this material, which is excellent. But where the feathers are, um, or where the fractures were larger, they often end up having uh, these wider areas at the surface. So they end up being glass infilled as well. And they don't typically, well, not always clean it out because it really is you know, making the ruby look better in this instance. So a lot of these rubies are both, or classed as both flux healed and also glass infilled. Uh, just to let you know, side point, you know, I think I mentioned it earlier, any ruby from any locality that's got fractures in it technically could be treated this way, but these are just the very common ones, the typical ones that are on the market. So let's have a look at these features then. So luster differences on the surface, first of all. So um, this is in a uh, flux healed stone. I know because I took this, you know, all these majority of these photographs myself. So you have inside, we have our flux healed features and on the surface here, due to the fact that it's quite a wide cavity, we, or a wide fracture, we have this luster difference. So we can actually see on our reflected facet, you've got the brighter areas, which is the bright vitreous luster of our ruby. And then these dull um, or vitreous areas, which is because of your glass, because this is also glass infilled. Here's another picture showing the same thing. So again, this is a flux healed stone, but also glass infilled because at the surface, you can see this change in luster. And then also we have a cavity here where there was a gas bubble as well. Oh, look over here, you can actually see just these pits and that's on top of a fracture. So that bit's fully flux healed, it looks. Didn't notice that before. 
And then we have our devitrification features. So devitrification, this is our crystallization of the glass. It's a process of glass becoming less glass-like because normally it doesn't crystallize, normally it's amorphous. Uh, this occurs because the glass is cooled down so slowly, it allows the crystallization of the glass. And here are, uh, here are the devitrification features, so crystallized glass. Uh, just here, that's our very surface edge of the fracture. And you can see extending into the stone away from us are these very branch-like crystals of glass. And these are your devitrification features. Here's another picture. So here, this is our surface of our stone and those branch-like crystals coming down, that is the crystallized glass. So again, your devitrification features. So that's all of our features. So let's revisit our learning outcomes because I have gone a bit over time. Let's revisit those learning outcomes. So what are flux healed rubies? Well, the answer is, is that it's a clarity treatment mainly, uh, but we are actually permanently healing together these uh, fractures. So it's performed on rough material, not on cut material. Uh, and the main effect is that permanently healing of open fractures, allowing us to cut bigger rough, um, sorry, allowing us to cut bigger stones out of the rough material. So how does this treatment affect the stone? Well, mainly uh, it's the yield from the rough, but as well, we've got this healing of the fractures, which increases the clarity, the removal of silk, which increases the clarity. We have a massive color um, enhancement due to the removal of that blue, and also this increased durability due to the healing of fractures. If glass infilling is left in there, of course, you'd actually then have a bit of a durability issue on that glassy area because that could be quite easily attacked by acids and things. So there we do, there we have a stone there. And the last learning outcome, how can we identify the treatment? Like with many treatments, it's all about the observation. So uh, we're gonna see these multiple surface reaching fractures. Um, beg your pardon, that should be feathers. Multiple surface reaching feathers extending from end to end of the stone. That is your first really big clue. And then if we look inside these feathers, we're gonna get that white granular translucent flux. We often see pits above these feathers. So these are often, you know, around quite a lot of the ruby. Uh, so here they are shown here, these pits right where the feather is meeting the surface. And then if it's also glass infilled, which they aren't all the time, uh, we may see a luster contrast on the surface and also the devitrification features. That's the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. So let's have a look on how um, oh, we are doing. We're going to actually launch our mini quiz. So that should be appearing on your screens shortly. Uh, for those of you who have done the mini quiz before, you know the drill. Uh, you just have to go through and answer uh, the questions and then submit at the end, and then we'll go through it as a group. Question number one. The main process of flux healing rubies is to fill the fractures with glass, to permanently heal open fractures, or neither of the above. So pick the one that you think is correct. Question number two, flux healed rubies flooded the market in what year? Choices are 1984, 1992 or 2004. Question number three, flux healed rubies are prevalent on the market, true or false? And the last question, which of the following features help to identify a purely flux healed ruby? And by that, I meant one that's not also glass infilled, so one that's been cleaned out with acid. And your choices of features include color flashes, flux feathers, devitrification features, luster differences on glassy surface areas, or multiple surface reaching feathers. So pick all the ones that apply for that last one. That is a multiple answer question. I'm actually just gonna answer a question that I've seen. 
whilst I'm waiting for those answers to come in. Claire has asked, can the flux be coloured in this process or is it typically not coloured? Well, um, from everything that I've read, it suggests that it's not coloured. The colouring element that would be required, as you probably know, will be chromium to make it red. But don't forget that actually when the flux is within the fracture and it's dissolving that surface material, there will be chromium in that dissolved ruby. So actually the deposited material will often contain chromium because it only requires the tiniest bit of chromium. They don't necessarily want to add chromium to the flux itself like they do aluminium because you can really easily add too much and then that would probably affect the colour negatively. So if you have too much chromium, you could get a black, you know, colour, you know, black substance, which wouldn't be desirable at all. So I don't think they add colouring elements, but I don't think that they need to. And I think that the synthetic ruby that grows in the fracture is probably um, red. Like from everything I've seen, it looks red. So even if it was like slightly paler, I don't think it would matter. But hmm. yeah, I think there's enough chromium to give it that red colour. Okay, very good. All right, let's go through this quiz, shall we? So I just need to review the quiz. I'm going to review it publicly so you should all be able to see the answers on your screen now. So almost all of you did it. Uh, so and oh, we do have some good results here. So let's go through it together. So question number one, the main process of flux healing ruby, rubies uh, is to permanently heal open fractures. That is the main reason of flux healing. OK, because the heating is doing the colour and that's doing also the clarity in regards to the silk. The flux healing is there really to heal those open fractures. It's not to fill the fractures with glass. It's why we don't call it flux filling. We call it flux healing. OK, if anything, any flux that is trapped within these fractures is probably, you know, a nuisance. It's, the, the treaters would much rather it not be there, but, it, you know, they can't help it, it gets stuck. Question number two, flux healed rubies flooded the market in 1992. So most of you got that right. Very, very well done. Question number three, flux healed rubies are prevalent on the market. True. So uh, from, you know, they've been around for nearly 30 years now. At one point, almost all rubies that were available on the trade were uh, these flux healed rubies from Mongsu. It's not that high anymore, you know, but it's still going to be Oh, actually, I don't know the figures, but you're still talking a huge majority of flux healed rubies. Um, and then the rest of it would be, you know, your diffusion rubies and then your heat only rubies. I'm not including lead glass filling in that because they're composite. And then question number four, which of the following features help identify a purely flux healed ruby? So the ones that are not glass infilled, the ones that have been cleaned out so that the glass isn't on the surface. And the correct answers is flux feathers. So those whitish trans lucent granular flux areas and also multiple surface reaching feathers although that's not guaranteed to have had this treatment it certainly is a very big red flag and a big clue to you the other answers i put there color flashes that's for lead glass filling completely different thing we're not talking about that at all uh, defitrification features and the luster difference in the glassy surface areas that would have been for your glass infilled gems okay so very very good well done. Thank you so much. Now we're going to go on to questions. So pop any questions you can think of in um, the chat section and I will endeavour to go through them. Uh, we're going to just do two or three, three or four in this part. And then like normal, if you want to stick around at the very end of the webinar, I will continue answer answering questions right at the end so that I can let some people go. OK, so let's just answer a few to start with. So here we go. Let's have a look what questions have come in. Melanie, as corundum is naturally colourless, is the deposited aluminium oxide in the fractures also colourless? Oh, I hope I actually answered that question when I answered the previous one, which is that due to the fact that it's actually dissolving the inner fractures um, of the ruby, that's actually getting chromium content from there. So I believe that actually it when it regrows and recrystallizes, it is actually chromium bearing still, because you only need a little bit of chromium. So I believe it is this ruby that is filling, um, that is healing together that fracture. Okay, so um, thank you, Melanie. Thank you so much. 
Um, Jackie, can these flux healed rubies be confused with flux grown synthetic rubies? Excellent question. Uh, I suppose maybe, but maybe not, because if we think about our synthetic flux grown rubies, these uh, are normally an excellent color, typically have really good clarity. If there is a feather within it, okay, that is a flux feather, it will be whitish, translucent, uh, possibly granular. But normally I expect there just to be one or two. I've rarely seen, a, I don't think I've ever seen a synthetic flux ruby that's absolutely riddled with these feathers. So that will be your first clue. Also, um, the feathers that might be in there might not even reach the surface. They might be fully encapsulated in the stone. Also in your synthetics, you're gonna have a complete lack of any natural features. Whereas in your flux healed stones, where they do originate from nature, you can still expect to see crystals and zircon halos from the high heat treatment and dotted silk and things like that. So, you know, we've got actually lots of things that can help us to differentiate those two. Excellent question. Thank you so much uh, for answering it. And then uh, Nishka asks me if this treatment is applied, oh, is this treatment applied to sapphires as well? And if so, does the identification features differ? So I've read that this treatment can be done on sapphires. I've never done it myself, but in theory, done it. I've never seen it myself. I don't treat rubies. Okay, I've never seen it myself. Um, but I've heard that sapphires are around. Scientifically speaking, there's no reason why they can't be treated in the exact same way. The only thing that I can think of is why they're not prevalent on the market the same way as these flux healed rubies are. Actually, I can think of a number of reasons. Firstly, blue sapphires are the most common color of natural sapphire. So you've actually got a very large number of these blue sapphires. They typically grow in larger sizes than rubies do. So sapphires are typically larger for their crystals and they're typically less included than rubies. So for those three reasons, we don't have this severe lack of rarity severe lack of availability in sapphires than we do in rubies. So that might be one of the reasons, but it's absolutely possible. I just haven't seen one. I don't know if anyone else has seen one, have you guys? I don't know. Let me know. Um, if you've got one, I'd love to see it as well. Uh, and just from a scientific, um, I'm, I guess I'll be assuming here, but from a scientific point of view, uh, the identification features should be the same because it would be the same process. But thank you very, very much. Um, Adesh has asked me, what type of flux is used in flux grown rubies? I'll be honest, I don't know. Um, I do not know. If anyone else knows, pop it in the comments. Uh, I've never looked into the exact um, chemical composition of the flux, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but you know, more interested in the gems itself, really. But uh, if anyone does know, let us know, or we can look into that, you know, to see if we can find any research on what flux is used. Um, and then we have John. John, where is this process undertaken? Like most ruby treatments, they're done in the ruby capital of the world, which is Thailand. And that's also where this um, treatment was created as well. So even though the rubies are not from Thailand, the rubies were from Mongsu, Myanmar, and loads of them are from Mozambique, uh, most of them are all treated in that treatment area of the world, which is Thailand. So yes, if I haven't got round to your question, I am sorry, but feel free to send me a message on Instagram or Facebook, or even email me at julia at juryadvisor.com. But otherwise, I hope that you've enjoyed this webinar and I do hope to see you next week for our session on fluorescence. Otherwise, that's it from me today. I hope that you have a great rest of your week. Bye. <laughs>